history of Bordeaux that most of you probably don't know. Because the history of Bordeaux that most of us know is that Eleanor of Aquitaine married Henry II of England. And that's, that was the reason Bordeaux became Bordeaux. And the truth of the matter is, it was until 1453 when the English were expelled from France. And actually, the wine trade between France and England stopped. So what happened then? In the early 1600s, it was the Dutch and the Scots who were trading the wine. And not only that, you probably w wouldn't recognize the wine they were trading was mostly white, which could be distilled and shipped long distances. And more interesting, the, most of the wine was being produced in grubs because the Medoc didn't exist. It was barren wasteland. It was marshes. It was underwater. It was just a low-lying area that couldn't be cultivated, couldn't be used. So if you think about the five first grows, the only one that existed in, in the early 1600s was Aubryon, which is upriver from Bordeaux, and actually on a hill 32 meters above sea level. So it wasn't flooded. So how do we get from here to where we are today is what I'm trying to. Yes, sir. Did Aubryon actually produce wine back then? Yes. We're going to talk about that in a second. Lucky to be on a hill. So let me introduce the first uh, of the cast of characters here. John de Pontac. John de Pontac came from a family that appears in the records of Bordeaux beginning like in the 1300s. By the 15th century, they were occupying various political offices. They were important people in Bordeaux. So in 1525, John de Pontac married a lady by the name of John de Bellon, uh, who was the daughter of the mayor of Libourne. And she brought with her some lands as dowry, including uh, this place called Aubryon, which was at the time under cultivation with grapes. So there was a vineyard at that point in time. And uh, the house that we now recognize it as Aubryon, it's actually a separate property, but John bought it because it was close by to Aubryon. And he did a total, you know, like, like they do in Bel Air, they, they tear the houses down. He, put up a new one. In 1549, he, he put up the structure that is now in place. And uh, he was patient. He added lands. He died at 101. And by the time he died, the estate was basically the size it is today. So this was the man who started Opion as we know it today. Well, here's the point. His, he, had a, he had a grandchild who uh, went by the name of Arnaud III, who inherited Chateaubriand in due time. And uh, this guy was a very enterprising guy. Now, this was the real genius of the, of the family. And he is given credit for a number of things. Topping barrels, racking. He basically made it possible for Bordeaux wines to age. He created all the techniques that would allow people to actually put wine in a barrel and have it live 5, 10, 15 years. And not only that, he loved the winery. He started blending and he started experimenting with different varietals to the point where he created something that became known as the, quote, new French claret. And stylistically, this would be the wine that you would start recognizing as being Bordeaux. So forget about that white wine from Graves. This is actually a red wine that tastes something like what we know today as Bordeaux. And this was a real hit in London. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of historians who will argue that Arnaud III created this wine specifically, like uh, we were talking, Jim, specifically for the London market. He sort of said, I'm going to create a wine that those English people are going to love. 
And in fact, they did. In 1663, I don't know if you remember Samuel Pepys, the diarist who wrote about the big fire in London. He actually, in his diary, wrote down, I just tasted this wine that's very different. It's called Aubrienne. And it's lo I love it. I love it. So this was the first tasting note of Aubrienne, 1663. And in the 1600s, Charles II, the cellar house, records that they were serving Obriono. This is the offici officially the first luxury brand that appears on records in the United Kingdom. So it is the oldest luxury brand to be recorded uh, back in the 1600s. So that's one step. We've now moved from a commodity that's being distilled to a recognizable red wine. Now this is more interesting. 1666, London burns down. It literally, two-thirds of downtown London burns to the ground. This is a, a huge catastrophe. And so now Aubryon in our Northern Third has lost his market. He's been, he's been doing very well shipping all this wine to London, and suddenly the market's gone. But the, the man is no slouch. He puts his son in a boat, and he sends them to London with the express purpose of opening a restaurant where they can push the wine. And he creates the first fancy restaurant in London, and it becomes a hit. It, it essentially becomes the one fashionable place in London. And uh, its numerous authors make mention of the restaurant, which was called Pontax Head. Uh, so it's, it, and now you have a, the demand for, quote, new French claret firmly in place. So that's your first ingredient. So now we got to go to the other one, which was the original launching point of this expedition. As, as you all know, uh, the Netherlands is a very low country, and most, uh, almost half of what we now know as the Netherlands is reclaimed land. And uh, this is all because obviously the Rhine River comes into the ocean and it's just flat marshes and like it's really bad. Uh, it's historically been a, just a gigantic marsh. But two things the Dutch invented changed that. One was the joint stock company, otherwise known as uh, publicly traded companies. And the other one was polder technology. And the combination of hydraulic engineering in the form of dikes, sluices, canals, and wind-driven pumps, all these mills actually started as water pumping devices. That's what they were used for. Uh, there's not a lot of wheat grown in Holland. These things are just pumping water, what they're doing. So land reclamation was extremely profitable, because if you think about what's going on, you have a marsh that's worthless, you drain it, you make canals, so, you know, there's, a, there's a whole technology aspect to it. it. It's a process that takes five to 10 years to do, not overnight. But at the end of that process, after you've invested a lot of capital, you have acreage, and it tends to be highly productive. It's just nice bottom farmland. So this technology was invented in the early 1600s. And it was a hit. Henry IV, who was king of France at the time, you know, basically saw this happening next door and decided that he was going to do it too. Uh, they created a company, a, a joint, joint stock company in 1607, uh, with a purpose of draining swamps around France. The, uh, the, the big projects that they did, mostly in the Poitou region, region of France, but, uh, and, and secondly, they tried to do it themselves and then very quickly realized why, why even try? Let's just hire the Dutch. So they hired the Dutch hydraulic engineers to do it for them. Uh, there's a whole other aspect to this. This was, the reason the king had to get involved is there was legal issues because the common people exploited the marshes as common land. They used them as fishing grounds, they used them to hunt birds, and 
And when these projects went on, they just suddenly, all this common land became private. So you needed the authority of, of the government to uh, carry out one of these plans. Uh, then there's a gentleman by the name of the Duc de Pernon, very, very prominent man during this uh, time. He served uh, three French kings in various capacities. Uh, very important guy. He was very rich at the time of his death. Uh, he eventually fell in disgrace because he hit a bishop with a cane. But uh, that caused his retirement in the late 30s to his estates in, in, the, in Gascony. And in, in, in 1638, nobody knows exactly when, he hired a Dutch guy to come take a look at his estate, which uh, sat on a hill that was called Mouton. So I know where, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, essentially, what he was doing is he was draining the land that eventually became Chateau, uh, Chateau uh, Mouton. So they contracted a man by the name of Jan Lichwater, nice name. Uh, it literally means low water. Uh, and uh, he actually was born something else, but he became, he became the, the, the swamp guy. Uh, so they, uh, they brought him to Bordeaux. He, he designed all the systems. And uh, you know, once the other landowners in the area saw this, they said, I want to do that too. And so there was a lot of uh, Bordeaux families that got involved in this project, and the Medoc got drained. And if you look at a map, if you, look, if you do Google Maps and you look at a map of the different chateaus, you will see all these like little blue lines, which are still the canals that provided the basis for the drainage. So there is, there's, and there's dikes on the banks of the Giron. And all these dikes are holding back the water. Uh, so having gotten to this point, what do you do with this land? So enter uh, a, a guy by the name of Pierre de Rouzan. Okay, so we're, we're walking through historical, through, through characters. Uh, there was a family called the Clausel family that owned uh, some land next to the Gironde that had this tower on it. And this was actually, believe it or not, a uh, pigeon uh, growing facility, a colombier, which had been built using the remnants of stone from an old military uh, uh, fortress. So they drained the land and they said, what do we do with the land? So they hired Mr. Rosan, for whatever reason, to plant vineyards. Uh, and Mr. Rosan, who was a wine negociant to begin with, said, this looks like a great idea. And going back to, uh, to the point that the negociants are the ones with cash money, he decided to buy some land near Margot to plant some vineyards. So this guy did very well. By the time he died, he owned about over 200 uh, hectares in Margot and Poyac. Uh, and when he died, he split his, his, his holdings. He gave his sons the land around Margot, and his daughter got the land in Poyac. So what happened to this family? Well. The Margot estates started being divided again through inheritance later in life. But in the original estate that Mr. Rosan built uh, in the 1600s, the original manor house is uh, Chateau Rosan Gassis, which is a second growth. Uh, one of the daughters, like this would be a grandchild, eventually marries the Baron Pierre Louis de Sigla in 1785. And Chateau Rosson Segla becomes the other half of this estate. And by the way, part of his original estate included Desmirai and Marquis de Term. So this was one gigantic block of Margot. So what happened to his daughter, who got the lands in Poyac? 
Uh, she married a gentleman by the name of Jacques Francois de Pichon, Seigneur de Longueville, who was president of the Bordeaux Parliament at the time. And in 1850, a couple of generations down the line, they split it again. Uh, Chateau Pichon Longueville Baron became the property of the male heir of the line. By that time, the, uh, the Pichon Longuevilles were barons as opposed to just plain seigneurs. Uh, and that is what we now know as Chateau Pichon Longueville Baron. And then the other half went to a daughter who was married at the time to the Count of uh, Lalande, so therefore becomes Chateau Pichon Longueville, uh, Comtesse de Lalande. So this is what you know, started this whole thing, is I'm trying to say, uh, there's all these wines that have the same names associated with it. You know, wh whether, why does this happen? And this is the reason it happens. It's just, at some point in time, they break up a larger estate, and they need two names to put it together. So who else is in this? Uh, great game. This is the Marquis de Segur. The Marquis de Segur actually was not, it's not like he planted vineyards. He was just uh, bred with the right uh, family connections. He inherited Chateau Latour through his uh, grandmother. Uh, his father actually purchased Chateau Lafitte in 1716 and inherited to the Marquis upon his death. Uh, the Marquis himself, he liked the wine business, so she, he bought Chateau Mouton, uh, added it to his holdings, and then he bought Chateau Calon through marriage. His wife owned uh, Calon Segur, what is now Calon Segur. And at, at one point in time, he also owned Chateau Ponte Canet and Chateau d'Armaillac. This is gigantic landholders, uh, very rich people. But he, you know, he was no slouch. He, he, was, uh, he served in the Privy Council for uh, uh, Louis XIV, I believe. He introduced this wine to London. Uh, Walpole was a big fan uh, of his wines. And uh, if you've seen the Chateau Calon Segur label, it's got a heart. And that refers to the fact that this guy, at one point in time, said, I make my wine at Lafitte and Latour, but my heart is in Canon. Uh, Calon. The estate eventually was broken up, but Chateau Latour remained with his family all the way through 1963. The Pontax, if you remember, were the Aubryon people. Uh, Arnold III de Pontac outlived his son, the guy who opened the restaurant in London. And upon his death, his daughter, also named Therese, inherited Chateau Brion, Aubryon. And she married a gentleman by the name of Jean Denis Dolet de Lestonac who happened to own Chateau Margaux. And uh, it, it, because Aubryon had been at the forefront of wine technology at the time, and they had developed a lot of techniques, uh, the marriage is, is said to have made Margaux also a fine wine uh, chateau, because they brought the, uh, the, uh, the Pontac family was the one that had the technology to make the great wine happen. So now we have have accounted for a lot of the very high quality chateaus. So what happens after that? Uh, as I mentioned, the descendants of the Segur family continued to own Latour for a long time. Uh, Joseph de Fumel, who uh, was a nephew of uh, inherited Aubryon uh, from his family, the Lestonax, and unfortunately, he lost his head in 1794. And all his properties were auctioned off. And uh, his nephews took, a court, uh, took uh, the case to trial. They got a pardon for Joseph so that he was claimed after his head had been put away. He, he, and they, re they got a restitution of the property. So they got the properties back. But they really couldn't sell. They, they couldn't hold on to them. It was rough economic times. And in 1801, they sold it to Charles Talleyrand, which, who was a very famous uh, politician at the time. And then it changed hands many times until bought by Clarence Dillon of Dillon and Reed. Uh, another member of the Lestonac family owned Margot, but uh, he was also a victim of the revolution. 
briefly, rest, again, they, they, these people would go to court and try to get the properties back. Laura de Fumel was, got it back, but he was forced to sell it. And then the Duran de Sierra family, descendants of the Rosans, held on to, to uh, different properties. The uh, Pichon Comtesse changed away from the family in 1925. And Pichon Baron, unfortunately, like flipped many, many, many times until it fell in the hands of an insurance company. Uh, so there you go. That's that, that, what I thought to be a very intriguing history of Bordeaux from, a, from a, a, a starting with the marshes and ending up with the Bordeaux we know today. There we go. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.